My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. Let's look at verse 12 here of John chapter 14 as we're slowly making our way <clears throat> through this chapter. Jesus is going to make a tremendous, unbelievable kind of promise. Verse 12. Verily, verily, or in other words, without a doubt, truthfully, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, notice not just believeth in me, but believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if there's one phrase that I want you to, to, to latch on to more than any other phrase in the message today, is that phrase there in, in verse 13, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Don't, don't take that phrase out of, you know, you look and you see where Jesus said, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. It's easy to get those two verses and to see those two and, and think, wow, this is unbelievable. I mean, I can pray for anything, right? You know, that's what Jesus said. I can pray for anything, any healing, any need, anything, any job I want. I can pray for anything and God will do it. But you can't, you can't take it out of context of what Jesus said. Jesus said, I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Jesus was trying to, as you know, as we studied this last week, Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples for a, a major storm. Verse, 14, verse 1 of chapter 14, Jesus starts out in this 14, 15, actually 13, 14, 15 or is all the last message that Jesus preached, taught to his disciples. And then in chapter 17, he prays over it all that it will solidify in their minds and they'll apply it. But in verse 1 of chapter 14, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And we studied last week some of the reasons why maybe they would be troubled. One, Jesus has told them, Previously, he said, we're going to Jerusalem, and when we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be handed over to the religious leaders. They're going to whip me. They're going to scourge me. I'm going to be crucified. Now, Jesus said, I'll be raised again the third day, but they didn't hear that. When he got to the point crucified, that's probably all they heard because crucifixion was a, such a horrible, horrific thing that they could not hear anything else. So Jesus has said, one, I'm going to be arrested, beaten, crucified. And then Jesus also says that I'm going to be leaving, and you can't go where I'm going. And so they were troubled, probably part of it, because of, uh, you know, one, thinking of what Jesus is going to go through, but then secondly, what? Not only what is going to happen to Jesus, but they were also troubled over what? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to us? Once this happens to you, what's going to happen to us? And if we stop following you, what are we going to do? Because for the last three, three and a half years, that's all we've done, night and day. We left our homes. We left our families. We left our work. We left everything. That's what Peter said. Lord, we've abandoned. We've forsaken everything to follow you. Night and day, we've gone wherever you've gone. And then you're leaving? So, you know, you know it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, you, you know, you talk about, you know, Bruce, you're reading a book, an avid reader, and you get up and, and you get to that climax part of the book, and then the author stops writing. You think, wait a minute, you've got to put another chapter. In. And we know there's another chapter, right? Book of Acts. Unreal chapter that's still to be written. And God is still writing the book of Acts. God, the Holy Spirit is still working through the church in this. But they didn't understand all of this. But Jesus is trying to encourage them. Don't be fearful. Don't be worried. Don't be confused. Literally, I think what Jesus is saying is, guys, and please listen to this, church. Jesus is saying, I am getting ready to pass the baton to you. Don't drop it. And that's what's been happening down through the years. One generation has been passing the baton down to the next. We're adults, where many of us were adults, we're parents, some of us were grandparents. 
and we understand now that life is not about us and we're not as concerned about ourselves, our primary goal now is that we make sure that we pass the baton into the hand of the next generation and that they grip it. You know, I tried to run track years ago in high school and I ran on a relay team. When you can't do anything else, they'll put you on the relay team, you know. They feel like there's three other guys that can make up for what you can't do. But, and the worst thing in a relay team is what? Is when they go to pass that, but that's the most critical part of the race. A lot of times the race is lost because they did not properly pass the baton and the next guy drops the baton. And we gotta make sure that our kids don't drop the baton. And that's what Jesus is saying right here. Guys, I'm passing it, don't drop it. And he's trying to encourage them. And he gave them, last week we talked about some about what he tried to encourage them. <clears throat> the first thing I think that he tried to encourage them with and to help build their confidence was the security of their salvation. Verse 1 again, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Whither I go or where I go, you know in the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. In the first part, I think that Jesus, when you think about this, Jesus is on this side of the cross here, you know. He's talking to his disciples. Let's use this pulpit as a visual illustration. He's here on this side of the cross. He knows that the cross is on the other, is, is right ahead of him in just a few hours. He's here trying to encourage their hearts before the storm hits. And the way that Jesus tries to encourage their heart is what? Takes them on the other side of the storm. He's taking them all the way to heaven. Guys, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm, you know, years ago, I used to worry about whether or not I could lose my salvation. I struggled for years and years. I debated whether or not I could lose my salvation until one day I was thinking about this passage and I made practical application <clears throat> and I took it, I looked at it this way. Let's suppose I would go to Tammy and I would say, Tammy, I have got a good friend coming for supper and I want, this is really, really a good friend. So I want you to get out to China. I want us to fix a really, really nice meal. I want to entertain them well. These, this person is very special to me. And she does, Tammy goes to all of that work and she prepares that meal and she sets the table. She has the house, you know, the candles burning, the white, you know, everything just really looks good. But my friend doesn't show up. That'd be bad, wouldn't it? Can you imagine Jesus going to prepare a place for me, but I not show up? See, the security of my salvation is not me, it's him. It's him. Can you know whether or not you are saved? You have to know that. You have. To. There are so many people who are doubting, wondering, and if you do not know whether or not you're actually saved, then you will not serve God. You're going to live a defeated life all of your life. Even if you are saved, you're going to live a defeated life. So hold your place here in John and go to the first John. First John is right before you get to the book of Revelation. <clears throat> John not only wrote one of the gospels, John also wrote three different letters. We call them epistles. He wrote three different letters to Christians. And a lot of what he wrote in first John is actually his interpretation of what Jesus taught in John chapter 13 through 16. It's a lot of the same thing. In chapter five of first John verse 11, he says, this is the record, and the word there literally means this is the testimony that God hath given to us eternal life. So you, you can be saved. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Now you can't make it much plainer than that. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. If you do not, you do not have eternal life. It's just that simple. It's all about Jesus. It's all about your relationship with Jesus. What does it mean to have the Son? Well, in verse 13, he, he says it in another way that helps explain it. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. 
What does it mean to believe on the name of the Son of God? He does not say to believe that Jesus lived upon this earth. That's not what he's saying. Believe on means to put your faith and trust. The word there, believe, is the word that is often translated as, as faith. It means to depend upon something, to put your trust in it. It means to sit down in a chair and take your feet off the ground. Put in all your weight in the chair. That's what it means to have faith in the chair. To have faith in Jesus for salvation means you come to Christ and you take your feet, you sit down in Jesus, what he said, what he's promised, and you take your feet off the ground, believing that it's totally Jesus. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name. The name means the authority of the Son of God. That there is salvation. That's what Peter said. There's no other name among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name that has authority to save us. Muhammad does not have the authority to save us. Confucius or whoever does not have the authority to save us. Jesus, the Son of God, does. Amen? Amen who believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may hope. Is that what your Bible says? Guess, wonder, what does your Bible say? No. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. How can I know that I have eternal life? Because I know that I have put my faith and trust. I know that when it comes to salvation, I have sat down in Jesus. And therefore, based upon the authority of God's word, I can know that I am saved. And so therefore, regardless of the storm that I go through, and I go through storms, and you go through storms, but regardless of whatever that storm is, even if that storm takes my life, he has prepared a place for me in heaven. And he will surely come and get me again one day. So it'll just, when I die, it'll just be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And that gives us confidence. That gives us confidence that you don't have to worry about the stock market. You don't have to worry about who necessarily gets in, or you worry about in the White House. You know, God's in control. He, he knew, the Bible says God knew the end from the beginning. God is God. Jesus, one, wanted to give them security in, in their confidence in their security of their salvation but there's another way that Jesus wanted to give them confidence and before you leave 1 John look what he says that John says here in verse 14 also John John he's following kind of what Jesus was teaching that night and this is the my Bible says confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything what according to his will he heareth us. We know that if he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Not only can I have confidence that I am saved, but I can have confidence that I can have a, a open dialogue, communication, we call it prayer, with my heavenly father where I can anytime, day or night, any situation, I can, even if I mess up, which I do a lot, Forgive me, please. I'm sorry. Help me. I have, that's my relationship. And I have a confidence in that. And I pray, you know, Paul talks about pray without ceasing. I do not stay on my knees constantly, but I pray without ceasing. Don't be offended, but sometimes I'm having a conversation with you and I'm praying. You come up to me and you say, I just want to talk with you about something. I've been in the ministry long enough. You know what I start doing? Oh, please, dear God, help me to be, give the right answer, whatever it is that they say. You know? Because sometimes some people want to invite you over to their house because you think they want to give you a piece of cake. And they just want to complain, you know, about something. And I'm human. And sometimes I want to react in my flesh. And so I'm praying. That gives me confidence that I can stay on track regardless of what's happening. Look back at John chapter 14. Again, verse 13. Jesus said, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that is in my authority. Under It not only means that you have access to God, but it means you're in alignment with God. 
You're in alignment with Jesus Christ. When you pray, you know, I cannot, I have prayed for so long, and I have said at the end of my prayer for so long, in Jesus' name, amen, that if I don't say that, I can't end the prayer. And what's unfortunate is that I have just put that as a tag on the end of my prayer. And Jesus never meant for it to be a tag on the end of your prayer. It means that you recognize that the only authority that you have, the only opportunity that you have to talk to God is in the name of Jesus. But the name of Jesus will take you into the throne room. It'll take you behind the veil. Amen? Into the very presence of God. That if... He says, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, that will I do. So let's talk just for a few moments about the power of prayer. What is Jesus saying? If you shall ask anything in my name, that will I do. Let me first of all tell you what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying, here is heaven's credit card, go shopping. Jesus is not saying I'm a genie in a bottle and all you have to say is in Jesus' name and your wish is my command. That is not what Jesus is saying there. Jesus is not saying you can use me to get anything you want. Or if you just pray hard enough, you can. No, you can't. Not if it's not God's will. You can't. You better hope you can't. The worst thing that can happen to us, for us is to pray out of God's will and God to say, okay. And he did that, right, for the nation of Israel. A king named Saul. So you better not, better not try to twist the arm of God to get him to do what you know in your heart is not the will of God. Because if he does it, somewhere along the way, you're going to wish that he hadn't answered that prayer. Jesus is not saying, here's a credit card, have a good time. Jesus is saying that if you pray things that you know in your heart are in alignment with the Word of God, which reveals the will of God, and that it's going to bring God glory. Listen, let me say that again because I'm afraid you're drifting off. Jesus is, he's not saying you can have anything you want. So, all right, you know that. Let's put that to the side. Jesus is saying that if you know it is in the will of God, and it will bring God glory. Go ahead and openly and boldly ask for it. I will do it. That's good to know that he is there with us going through life, whatever it might be. Jesus was always about doing his Father's will and bringing his Father glory. Jesus said, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Look, if you will, right before this passage, there's another conversation that went on here in John 14 between Jesus and the disciples. And I really had a very difficult time understanding where Jesus was going from one subject to the next. And actually, I believe that Jesus, you know, uh, Brother Bruce and I, we were talking here a while ago. He was asking me about how do you prepare a sermon? I told him how I tried to, and sometimes it didn't get there. But anyhow, but normally when I have a sermon, I have an outline. I don't preach everything that's in the outline, and everything I preach is not in the outline, but I have an outline. I have a general idea of what I believe so that I stay on track with the passage. And Jesus had an outline, I think, in his mind that he was teaching to his disciples that night. One about salvation, the next one is about prayer. But then there were other things that came up during the conversation that Jesus had to fill in. And here's one of the things that came up in the conversation. Jesus kept talking about the Father. I'm going to the Father. Prepare Verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, to show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. In other words, listen, the Jews never called God Father. So they really, I think that part of their confusion was, who is the Father? Are you talking about God? Wow. God's Father? Huh. So that's part of what they were struggling about. Philip says, just show us the Father and we'll be okay. Verse 9, Jesus said unto him, Philip, have I been with you so long time with you and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? So what does that mean? That's hard to understand because it's the Trinity 
And I can't explain to you the Trinity. Is, is Jesus saying that, don't you understand that I'm the Father that's just been disguised as the Son? That's not what Jesus is saying. Because there are times in Scripture when the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three. Some people say the Trinity is like water, you know, liquid, ice, vapor. That is not an explanation of the Trinity. Because water is either vapor or it's water, liquid, or it's, you know, that's saying it's going from what God was not the Father one moment and the Son the next moment and the Spirit the next moment. He was always the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The only thing, the only way that I can even begin to get a handle on this is when it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, one. There are two different Hebrew words for the word one. One Hebrew word means one as in one, singular, number. The other Hebrew word means one as in unit, one. The husband and wife shall become one flesh. That is not the word singular. It's the word unit. When it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, when Jesus said, or when it says Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, actually, the word right there is not one singular. It's the word one unit. That doesn't explain the Trinity, but... Here's what I think it, it, it's saying. Now, here's what I think Jesus is saying right here. Please listen to this. Jesus is saying, Philip, one, you can't see God because God's invisible. Okay? He's spirit. He's invisible. But Jesus is saying, Philip, I am at such oneness with God the Father, that anything you've seen me do or anything you have heard me say, it has been what the Father would do or what the Father would say. Oneness of purpose. Oneness of unity. I'm not here about myself. I'm here about the Father. Look at verse 10. Thou believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father's in me? There's a oneness. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth. Then he says the works. So Jesus said, I'm not just telling you what. I haven't just been telling you something hoping that God will endorse it. Everything that I've said that I knew that is it's what the Father's told me to say. I have not just been thinking, you know, wow, that person is really sick. And, you know, it would really be nice if I would heal them. And I think that I'm going to try to heal them. And, boy, I just hope that the Father will help me heal them. That's not what, that's not what happened. Jesus said, everything I said was from, there was such a oneness. That everything I said, it was what the Father would say. Everything I did is what the Father would do. And here is the point of application on this for us. I, I have not reached it yet. I don't think I will reach it till I get to heaven. But Christ's purpose for my life is that, matter of fact, Jesus prays it in John 17, that we may be one, even as he and the Father are one. The Christian life, being a follower of Jesus Christ is coming to the point to where we stop serving self so that we might become one with God so that what we say and what we do is as if God would say and do it. And that's hard to do. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit is saying, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, shut up. Get out of the way. They need to hear how smart I am. Why in the world did I say that? You ever, anybody know what I'm talking, you tracking with me? See, God's put the Spirit, I'm going to study about the Spirit more, and Jesus is going to teach about the Spirit. But he's there to, the Christian life, the Christian life is not us trying to be good and somehow come to God and please God. The new covenant, as it is told in the Old Testament, is that God is finally going to put his spirit inside of us. And through his spirit, 
we're finally going to fulfill the will of God. That's why we have to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. So therefore, to pray in the name of, of Jesus means you're praying in His authority, but it also means that you're praying in alignment with Him. I have no right to try to go to God and to get God to do something that I do not have a sense of peace in my heart is the will of God. That's sinful for me to do that. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that there are reasons why God will answer our prayers and there are reasons why God will not answer our prayers. Let me share with you a few of the reasons why God will not answer prayers. James says because they're selfishly motivated. Praying about good things for selfish reasons is wrong. In my opinion, it's, it's not near to selling doves in the temple. Trying to use God for selfish gain is wrong. The Bible says we, God will not answer prayers if they're not according to his will. The Bible says God will not answer prayers if we're known harboring sin in our life. The Bible says God will not answer prayers if we have lack the faith to believe that God will answer prayers. And James says God will answer, never answer prayers if we don't pray them. So there's a lot of reasons why God will not answer prayers. But let me mention to you some of the prayers God will answer. Give us this day our daily bread. What's that prayer about? That prayer is about, God, I am totally dependent upon you. I need you to provide even the material things. Giving, tithing, tithing is not about giving the church money so that the church can have money to do whatever it wants to do. God does not need the money. Tithing is about recognizing that what we have in our pocket came from God. And if you don't ever give to God, then you're assuming that it all belongs to you. That's pride. Selfishness. Tithing is about recognizing that it came from God, so I'm going to give. And you want to use tithe, give, whatever you want to say there. You know what I mean? Giving. It's about recognizing where it came from. And I give it back. I give it to God. Which God does what? He gives it back. Shaken down, pressed over, you know, run. God gives it back. Even more. Prayer, God will answer prayers where we're dependent. The Bible says don't be anxious about anything. Pray about everything. God will answer the prayer when we ask for a true forgiveness of sin. Where not only we just want to escape the consequences, but we want cleansing. So that we might have fellowship with God. God will answer that prayer. God will answer the prayer when we pray for deliverance from simple temptations. You know what here has amazed me? This is something I've been meditating on a lot. A lot of times when I pray, the, what we call the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer comes up in my mind when I go to pray. And here's what's an amazing thing. If I was God and I would say, okay, here's how you should pray. You're a bad, sinful person. You mess up a lot. If I was God, here's how I'd lay out the order. The first thing you need to pray for is forgiveness of sin. Right? Isn't that what you pray for first? Forgiveness of sin? But the way Jesus taught us to pray, God's glory and will is even above our forgiveness of sin. Whether or not we get forgiven is not the issue. It's whether or not God gets glorified. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our... Forgiving our sins is way down on the list. God even comes above us. Getting forgiven of our sins. God's will to be done. God always wants us to pray for that, for wisdom, for guidance. But the primary thing, and I've got I to gotta hurry through this. Look, if you will, go to Ephesians chapter 6. And this is really what I believe that Jesus was, was really, and please, please stay with me. Because this is what I believe Jesus was really the intent, but behind what he was trying to teach his disciples that night. Many of you know that Ephesians chapter 6 is about fighting spiritual warfare. Put on the whole armor of God. He talks about it in verse 11. And then Paul goes down through the various pieces of armament that you and I put on. But then in verse 18, Paul says something that, that some people detach from the spiritual armor. Even though he doesn't specifically call it a piece of armament, I believe that it is. It's least in his train of thought. 
verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Supplication means specific prayer for specific needs in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance for, and supplication for all saints. In other words, pray about everything for everyone. But then notice Paul's prayer request for himself in verse 19. And for me. So what do you think Paul, he's in prison when he's writing this. Let me stop here for a second. If you were in prison and you were sending a prayer request to the church, what would your prayer request be? Get me out of prison. That is not what Paul prays for. And for me, that utterance, literally it means the words may be given unto me, the ability, logos, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. What was Paul's prayer request? Was it God get me out of prison? No. What was it? God, make me bold even in prison. Give me the words to say. Give me the ability to say it. And then give me the availability to do it. Fill my mouth with the things. Pray for me. And I don't know this, but Paul was human. So maybe Paul was feeling the pressure of being in prison. And you know Satan was attacking him and trying to say, you know, if you would just be quiet, you wouldn't be in this mess. If you just tone down some... You wouldn't have to worry about this. And so I have no doubt. He's talking about spiritual warfare. This is the thoughts in his mind. So I have no doubt that Paul's thinking about part of the spiritual war. You know what Satan was trying to do to the apostle Paul. If any man Satan ever tried to silence, it would have been Paul. And Paul said, I do not want to be silent. I want to be bold. I want to be open. I want to be confident. I want to speak the truth without any hesitation. Pray for me that I will be bold. Look at Acts chapter 4. Will that kind of prayer work? Look quickly at Acts chapter 4. The early church prayed the same kind of prayer. Peter and John have been arrested. They've been beaten. They've gone through this ordeal. They come back to the church. What do you think that they would say to the church after they've been arrested and beaten and threatened? Boy, we better just get quiet. No, that's not what the church prays for. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed for boldness, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Can I be really, really honest with you here for a second? I'm almost never ever hear anybody ask for boldness to witness. Now, we need to pray for sickness. We need to pray for finances. We need to pray for all those things. And I'm not trying to be mean, but I just want to be honest. Let's be honest about it, brethren. If I'd, to most morning, I'd say, okay, I just, we just got to take an hour. We're going to take prayer requests and have prayer. What would 99% of the prayer requests be? God, please help such and such who's sick. And that's good. But I doubt that anyone would pray. Please help me to talk to my mom, to talk to my dad, to talk to my son, to talk to my daughter, to talk to my coworker. Pray for me that when I go into school tomorrow, I won't just blend in with all the other students, but the circle of friends that I have. I will look for an opportunity to tell them how they can be saved. I made a profession of faith when I was 12 years old. I grew up in a good Baptist church. I heard the gospel every Sunday. I went to high school. I was a wild kid. 
few years ago, somebody sent me an email, two or three years ago, somebody sent me an email, my sister-in-law, and she said, did you know that such and such died? And I said, no, I didn't. And he was my very best friend. We sometimes bought clothes that looked alike. That's how, that's how tight the bond was between the two of us. I stayed in his house. He stayed at my house. We knew each other's mom as our mom. I knew the gospel truth, but I never once said anything to Mike about it. Tammy and I, she went with me, went over to Blacksburg to the funeral home in line, seeing some people I haven't seen for a long time, didn't even recognize them. You know, you change. And I'm just thinking, this is so bad. This is crazy. And, and one of our other friends came up to us and he said, uh, he said, did you, did you know that Mike got saved? I thought, oh, yeah. No, I didn't. Thank you for telling me that. I said, how did it happen? And Matt said, he said, you'll never believe this, Terry. But he said, you know something? Matt said, you and I were claimed to be Christians and knew the truth. And he said, God had to save an atheist and make him a preacher so that that atheistic preacher would go to him and share with him the gospel and Mike would be saved. And I praise God that Mike got saved. But I'm ashamed of the fact that I never tried to. I was afraid. I was afraid I'd be laughed at. I was afraid that they'd think, you know, you're weird for doing all that. And Jesus is saying to us, listen, guys, the storm's coming. There's going to be the cross, but don't worry. It's going to continue on. And you need to understand now how to pray so that you, well, I'm passing the baton on to you. And if you read the book of Acts, you will, you will discover quickly that prayer was a major part of that church. 